evening. My name is Lori Jackson, co-chairperson of the Kennedy School Black Caucus. On behalf of the Black Caucus of the Kennedy School of Government, I would like to welcome you all to the second annual Oliver Cuomo Cox Lecture Series. This series is in honor of the renowned early 20th century black sociologist and economist Oliver Cromwell Cox, who spent much of his academic career trying to understand and explain the continual underclass position of black Americans. We hope that the series will become an annual event at the Kennedy School. On behalf of the caucus, I would like to extend sincere thanks to all those persons and organizations who helped make this current series possible. The theme chosen for this year's lecture series is Strategies for Black Americans in the 80s. Tonight's is the second of three discussions scheduled on the first three Thursdays during the month of March. This evening's discussion is entitled Blacks and the New Media, Views and Perspectives for the 80s. This topic was chosen in keeping with the original intent of the Cox Lecture Series to provide a forum for discussing issues of great concern to black Americans. As we all know, the media is an extremely powerful force within American society and has been an area in which blacks and other minorities have been woefully underrepresented and misrepresented. We believe that there is a need for formulating strategies to increase minority participation within the communications industry. The present advances in media technology present an opening of a new frontier. It is critical that blacks become involved in this pioneering and establish a firm foothold at the outset. Tony Butler, Media Service Coordinator for the Kennedy School of Government and the Institute of Politics, has contributed a great deal of time and effort in working with the caucus to organize tonight's panel. I would like to ask Tony to come and make a few remarks about this evening's topic. Thank you. Um, thank you, Lori. Uh, let me thank you all for coming out this evening to join us and to thank our panelists for selecting uh, to be with us this evening. I'd also like to take a moment to welcome you all on behalf of the Kennedy School of Government and the Institute of Politics. I'd like to welcome you to our house. As Lori mentioned, I'm the Media Services Coordinator for the Kennedy School and the Institute, which means I manage all of the audiovisual and video activity which support the academic and other programmatic affairs that go on in this multi-dimensioned community which also means I do live here, um, delivering film projectors at 9 a.m. for classes, setting up video cameras and microphones with the help of some of the folks you see around you now for events like this evening's, and also serving as a technical liaison on weekends for network news crews that like to use this uh, very creative space, as you can see around you. To be honest with you, though, it is pretty satisfying to, be, to right now be behind the microphone that I usually set up as you can see, it's something I'm trying to get used to. Uh, I didn't plan to be here, though. Uh, like many of you probably, I had to learn the hard way about taking initiative, something no doubt many of you have experienced. I thought I could play behind the scenes to play a behind the scenes role, helping the Black Caucus um, to organize this panel on blacks in the media. Only now has the lesson been duly demonstrated to me that when one takes initiative, people tend to look, for, look to you for initiative. And so here I am, a little bedraggled with the rest of the students that put this together, um, having been asked tonight to help explain to you why the angle of the new media is appropriate for this setting and what we hope to accomplish. But first, let me take time to offer praise where praise is due and thank the Black Caucus, particularly Jackie Gordon, Clyde Nora, and Farabee Kennedy, who demonstrated the real initiative in making this evening happen, and continue to give testament to the strength and commitment of black people and other people of color to ensure that our concerns are presented in these settings. Briefly then, we felt a forward-looking approach to the media 
implied by the overall theme of the series, Strategies for the 80s, must give consideration to the, communi the communications revolution, to the advent of the information age. Though issues of advocacy for better representation in existing media remain pressing, it is an off-stated sentiment these days that the new media, cable TV, low-power television, video text, direct broadcast satellite, and the potential interface of all the above with computers may offer blacks and other interest groups who, who were substantially left out of the picture at the advent of broadcasting a chance to get, and I do mean to own and control, pieces of the new communications pie. That is, of course, if we can prepare ourselves in time to, as the saying goes, strike while the iron is hot. And so this panel is offered as a political discussion, one of Webster's uses of the word politics being activities concerned with achieving control, advancement, or some other goal in a non-governmental group. And more specifically, this evening is offered as an informational service to people in general and to people of color in particular, interested in getting a better idea of what is happening on the many fronts that are defining the scenario which we are already operating in. We brought <clears throat> one of the few black doctors of communications this evening, Dr. Gilbert Mannix, a PhD in mass communications, to offer us an historical overview of our position in the industry, along with some discussion of cable programming and some prescriptive advice on how we can continue to prepare ourselves to play a greater role in this new era. We brought a communications council to the Senate Commerce Committee, Mr. Riley Temple, to give us some, some idea of the politics of what's happening in communications these days. We've also brought a person, Ms. Darlene Tobert Palmer, who is most recently coordinator of federally sponsored communications management development initiatives for people of color. And we brought an entrepreneur, Mr. Percy Sutton, who is putting all the pieces together and making new inroads. We hope through their presentations and our subsequent queries to get a clearer idea of how possible or perhaps not possible access and ownership or fuller participation is in this era of new media and to contribute to the process of preparing ourselves more fully to exploit whatever opportunities may be present. I advise you to listen well. Time is short and as you are no doubt aware the game is complicated and the ball is moving fast. Our moderator for the evening will be Mackie McLeod, who many of you no doubt know. Mackie is currently a research fellow at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Telecommunications Policy and, a, and, and an associate professor at UMass Amherst. Additionally, he is founder and president of Global Village Association, Inc., a Ro Roxbury-based technical assistance organization that provides technical information sharing opportunities and consults with, with professionals of color in radio and TV production and programming. The firm specializes in radical applications of existing and new information technology. Mackey is a true communicator and has been instrumental in helping us define and promote this panel. I'd like to introduce him now and he'll go ahead to give you some of his impressions on the politics of media and then introduce the panelists more specifically. Thank you. I'm uh, very pleased to be here uh, as moderator of uh, this very important panel, uh, which has the effect of assembling some of the most uh, important people in an area that has been uh, shielded from the knowledge of black folk. Uh, and what I thought I'd offer uh, is some of the results of my research in uh, the area of telecommunications um, and particularly the area of information sharing and uh, what the new world information order means uh, internationally and what it may mean here in the United States with the uh, emergence of uh, new technologies. 
like uh, most of uh, the world's resources, uh, the information flow and the ability to communicate on a uh, regional, uh, national, and international basis has essentially been uh, a power that has been usurped uh, by the dominant uh, culture here in the United States. We're talking now in the national context. We're, we're speaking of a point, uh, uh, a point in history as far as black people's cultural development is concerned when at one point it was illegal uh, to read and write and to uh, deal in the basic areas of communication. And so with that as our starting point, it's hard to uh, grasp how with the emergence of new technologies, one of the central questions in technological development, uh, institutionalized racism in this country is going to uh, affect ownership of uh, the new technologies, the way that they're applied, the places that they're applied, and, and who the actual participants are. The New World uh, Information Order, as it's been called, uh, is the development of uh, the summit of non-aligned countries in 1976. Uh, they and later the United Nations Economic, Social, and Cultural Organization uh, decided that the monopolization of communication, the uh, distortion of developments in the developing world, where over 70% of the world's 4 billion people live, uh, was something that was no longer going to be countenanced. Uh, and as such, those, that kind of research spurred other research into exactly how media is dominated. Some of the UNESCO data that I thought you might find interesting is that roughly 80 out of any 100 news dispatches issued that you see in uh, national and uh, local newspapers are issued by Associated Press, United Press International, Reuters, Agence France Press, and past news agencies. None of those agencies are working for the benefits, uh, are working for the uh, better understanding of uh, black culture in the United States, nor international cult culture in, in general. That was uh, a point that was recognized and as a seminal point, one of the, uh, the springboards of the New World uh, Information Order. 50 to 70 percent of the basic education of most of the people in Western civilization, so-called, comes from radio, movies, and television, another important indicator. and. Uh, as we think about that, and we think about the increased time spent by people of color in involvement, in involvement with television, we know that, for example, the number of hours that young black children are spending before a media which has essentially uh, demonstrated its hostility to them on a number of occasions in a number of ways, um, that's something that needs to be questioned with the ability and the proliferation of even more media, yet with this central component, uh, this hostility uh, and uh, poor image depiction, uh, we need really to question whether uh, the existing programming that would be even further blossomed by the new technology is something that we want to have. Uh, the questions here are questions of control of this new media once it has uh, uh, been further developed. Uh, it's questions of public participation. Cultural imperialism as an, as an issue. Uh, the fact is that uh, as we exist with uh, the existing technologies, with existing television, film, and radio, um, it, it poses a, a series of quandaries. That in the same way, uh, and I think since we're talking about an, an area that is uh, in large part intangible to most uh, people who have not spent time around it, it may be good to parallel it to other issues of public concern. In the same way that people are now concerned with the uh, uh, poisoning of their water and their air by toxic waste, we need to start questioning as a part of the New World Information Order the poisoning of our people and of our communities by uh, the unseen agent of distorted uh, media that is dominated by uh, a group of people. And uh, when we talk about who owns the media in this country, we have to remember that we're talking about pure corporate ownership, uh, ownership 
uh, that reflects some of the most hostile patterns uh, uh, against people of color and uh, that shows no sign of that hostility abating as we uh, approach uh, economic downturn here in the United States. We, and, and I, I don't want to uh, step into uh, Dr. Maddox's area um, with both feet, but there needs to be some kind of question about uh, the fact that there are one, approximately 1,000 television stations in the United States, and although we, as a presence in the United States, have been here and in recent years have been able to put together major capital formations in order to acquire some of that media, still only eight of those television stations of a total of 1,000 are owned by people of color. A at that, the first of those stations only uh, began in 1975. Uh, of the 8,500 radio stations approximately uh, existing, uh, perhaps 220 of those are black owned or oriented. Uh, I'm, I'm offering this only to say that if we are not involved and if we have never been able to get a handle on the existing technologies, uh, those that uh, the federal government was uh, attempting to give uh, people of color some uh, options on and uh, abilities to obtain in, in recent years, how are we to believe that we are going to control um, and, and be able to fully implement the new technologies? I'm trying to point to uh, a, a direction of a new consensus in the black community, uh, the national black community, around the ownership of these uh, new information technologies, a question that is going to be posed here in Boston around the ownership and access to cable television. Um, at the same time that we're focusing on cable television, uh, it appears that almost all of our attention is drawn toward one of uh, the technologies and at that a rather modular technology at the same time that uh, the major corporations are spending their research and development money on direct satellite broadcasting. They're speaking of universal systems at a time when we're speaking of modular systems. Um, some of the voices of the, the what's being called the New World Information Order, people that perhaps you know and respect, uh, perhaps can give you a, a better feeling for the policy dilemma that faces us uh, in the 80s and beyond. Uh, let me quote from Frantz Fanon briefly, who said the colonialism, and I, I see us in a colonial model here, and I don't think we should fool ourselves about uh, the fact that uh, we are operating, uh, at, at least in the informational sense, under a system of apartheid, uh, very clearly drawn. Uh, colonialism is not satisfied merely with holding a people in its grip and emptying the native's brain of all form and content. By a kind of perverted logic, it turns to the past of the oppressed people and distorts, disfigures, and destroys it. Uh, in the coverage of uh, events that take place in the developing world, I think it's, it's clear enough to the people who are assembled here that we're getting less than the, the facts on uh, everything from the uh, coverage in Vietnam, which has now turned out to be uh, less than even close to the truth. Uh, the coverage in Iran, which we didn't find out until a Boston journalist named William Worthy went and brought back the facts. Uh, and in the coverage of the developing world's dynamics and some of its more positive stories. Uh, Gil Noble, the WABC television co-anchor and author of a new book called Black is the Color of My Picture Too, uh, who will be in Boston, as a matter of fact, on the 14th to speak a bit about the new media, uh, makes this point. The values that are being disseminated by mass media are being imposed on peoples of African and Asian descent. I don't believe that media are innocent or naive because there are too many government agencies that have been deeply involved in news coverage, in manipulating news coverage, and in distorting and breaking certain kinds of stories that are in their political interest. I think we really need to become more serious about the media, stop looking at it as entertainment, stop trusting it, and begin to struggle against it. Tran Van Dinh, who is a Vietnamese and the Professor of Pan African Studies at the uh, Pan African Studies Department at Temple University says that you don't colonize people just with guns. You also colonize with information. 
I'd like to propose today some action we can take together, knowing very well that the next battle of the world is no longer a battle of guns, but a battle of ideas, the battle of information. We must know what's going on in other parts of the world in terms of cultural colonization. And finally, Udayan Gupta, who is a contributing uh, writer for Black Enterprise magazine, and has done some work uh, on electronic redlining, how already with the new information technologies, some of the same uh, financial principles that were used uh, to prevent black participation are now coming to the new technologies. Udayan Gupta says the trap is to believe that this society is as interested in us as we are in terms of where we come from, who we are, and who we want to be. The lie is to believe that we are aesthetically and technically underdeveloped in creating media forms, that there is a universal standard and a technology by which we must be judged. We need to have more dialogue. We need to recognize that criticism is not antagonism. Finally, we need to accept our role in trying to create a more accurate media, a more effective media, and a media that represents us, not how others see us. And I would only add that if the new technologies and the people who plan to implement them are not able to realize some of the aspirations that are, are uh, embodied in these statements, then I don't, I don't really see it as an advance. And uh, we'll be hearing from others on the panel who are going to be talking about the way that the new technologies are, are going to be applied. I want to first introduce uh, Dr. Gilbert Maddox, uh, who is a veteran Detroit broadcaster of more than 20 years and the first black in the nation to earn a PhD in the mass communication field. He has produced and hosted a number of television series for both public and commercial broadcasting. His award-winning Profiles in Black series was a pri primetime public affairs feature for more than a decade. As the assistant director of Focus, Hope, a civil rights organization, he pioneered video programs for educating and motivating members of low-income families. Additionally, in concert with the Detroit Public Schools, he developed a series of public forums which examined the impact of mass media on urban life. As a faculty member at Howard University, the University of Michigan, and Wayne State University, he helped train some of the nation's outstanding journalists and broadcasters. Dr. Maddox has produced a number of films and was the recipient of the Ford uh, and Rockefeller Foundation Society. Mother is certainly of my being here. In fact, as I told her that I would be in Cambridge, she admonished me to be very careful of my language so that if I revert to the vernacular of the street in a moment of passion, I want you to remind me that Mama may be listening. <laughs> <coughs> At the same time that I'm pleased to be here, I'm also a little distressed because I visited here exactly 11 years ago uh, at a panel uh, that was convened by the Congressional Black Caucus. And the problems and concerns expressed on that occasion were essentially the focus of tonight's panel. How do you best mobilize the newer communication technology to serve the needs and concerns of urban America? How do you overcome the distorted images of broadcast entertainment and the bias for our sorely neglected news coverage. I'm not so sure that in that 11 years since I was last here that much has been done uh, in the broadcast industry. In fact, I am reminded of the haunting refrains of Stephen Vincent Benet's poem, John Brown's Body, that John Brown's body lies moldering in the grave. He will not come again with foolish pikes and a pack of desperate boys to shadow the sun. The cotton will grow next year in spite of his skull. Slaves will be slaves next year in spite of the bones. Nothing has changed, John Brown. Nothing has changed. And that could very well be true. It appears to me that as I talked last time, there was a student protest at this university against uh, the to some extent control the resources that will allow for the production of programs and the delivery of cable services that can enrich our lives, unify us, and really help us to survive. Because at this point, I think, as the brother has pointed out very clearly, we are about the business of survival. We live in a truly amazing age, and an age in which the most amazing and dramatic changes are taking place.
that will alter the basic fabric of our lives. It is an era that is uh, seeing fantastic advancements in science, in the arts, and in our general standard of living. It has been described, on the other hand, by at least uh, another period that is quite similar to this period, and that was the period that Charles Dickens described in the prologue to his Tale of Two Cities, written in 1859, when he said that it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom and it was the age of foolishness. It was the season of light and it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope and it was the winter of despair. I think those words may apply to this era as well. This has been called the age of communication, the age of information and smart machines. Alvin Toffler calls it the age of the third wave in which the sheer physical strength and mechanical skills of the agricultural age and the age of the industrial revolution are ages of the past and are now essentially passe. This is an era in which the average home will contain not only a television set, but an information processing and communication center as well. Within the next decade, viewers can expect the advent of three-dimensional wall-sized pictures of the highest possible definition, with stereophonic sound equal to that played in our finest concert halls. Cable television, the most important of the new technologies, will allow viewers to receive programming on as many as 120 channels. Much of that programming will be transmitted by means of communication satellites in geostationary orbit 23,000 miles above the Earth. Programs will include the best in movies, sports events, cultural programs, children's programming, educational programming, women's programming, Spanish language programs, senior citizen programming, country and western program, and also programming narrow casted to people and groups with special interests such as skiing, traveling in Africa, religious shows, soap operas, soap operas incidentally which may speak as a programmatic form to some of the fundamental problems that black folks have to deal with and we have yet to, to develop a systematic mechanism for talking particularly to the young people in our community and I would suggest to you young persons that the soap opera as a program form may be the best possible way for dealing with problems of pregnancy and all of the other problems that our young persons are heir to. But to go on, we can look forward to classical and foreign films, adult movies with a special key that lock off certain channels to youth or to wayward husbands. <laughs> as well as 24-hour news, proceedings of the House of Representatives, movie reviews, and superstations that inform us of the taste of viewers in such widely dispersed cities as New York, Chicago, Atlanta, and San Francisco. In fact, Percy Sutton tells me, according to the things that I read, that we can look forward to a lot of programming emanating out of Harlem's old Savoy Theater, was it, Percy? And that's going to go up on the uh, transponder uh, on one of the RCA communication satellites, hopefully. Cable will allow us to produce programming that truly reflects the unique taste of our communities rather than the mass taste programs we are now forced to view. Programs which unite us and encourage us to come back home. Programming that teaches our youth how to read and encourages parents to motivate them to prepare for our competitive world. Programming which highlights the exceptional artistic talent of our cities, our actors, our dancers, and our musicians. Programming that glorifies those people who make significant contributions to our cities, the scientists, the businessmen, and the teachers, as well as the entertainers and the sports personalities. Programming that correctly identifies and is supportive of our leaders rather than highly critical. Programming that articulates and takes pride in our history and culture, 
as well as the history and culture of all ethnic groups who inhabit our cities. Programming that encourages us to unite and to respect our old people and to trust each other and to patronize our professionals and businesses. Programming that is supportive of the institutions of our cities. And it should also include news and public affairs programming that are accurate and speak to the vital concerns of our cities. News that does not distort, does not unfairly depict our leaders. News that does not overemphasize the sensational, the fires, the murders, in pursuit of co commercial ratings. In the most positive sense, there will be local programming that fulfills the prophecy of one of our most cherished writers and poets, Langston Hughes, who wrote many, many years ago in a poem entitled Notes on the Commercial Theater, that one of these days, somebody will stand up and talk about me and write about me and sing about me, black and beautiful, and put on plays about me. And I reckon it'll be me, myself, yeah, it'll be me. And cable will provide that opportunity for local citizens and youth who have a proven record of positive accomplishments to operate the system and to offer our young people, our high school and college graduates, an opportunity to use their creative skills in a positive, supportive environment. I can go on and on and talk about, and I, you will excuse me because I'm editing as I go along. Uh, in addition to programming, there is, of course, going to be all kinds of other services that have major significance for our cities. Uh, let's talk about one thing because it's, it's an idea that I think it's a very significant idea, and I would like to see it happen. I'm not so sure that it can happen. Maybe Percy Sutton can comment on it later on. All of our cities, and all of us are concerned about the outflow of capital out of our cities. We have often talked about the amount of disposable income that goes into our suburban communities, never turning over into our cities. I would suggest to you that one of the things that you as young persons ought to explore is the possibility that through one of the services of cable video shopping, that maybe a franchise can be turned over to persons living in that inner city. And then if Sears and Saks and all of the other commercial concerns who currently take money out have to come to the brothers and sisters who own that video shopping franchise, then that money is going to be refiltered and recirculated within that city. I think that is a very viable approach. I'm not so sure whether we can pull it off, but I have an idea that we can. Certainly we can do things like reduce crime because uh, we have monitoring systems, we have burglar alarm systems, we have fire alarm systems, we have systems that can bring the best of medical care and medical alert to inner city persons. In fact, we even have a system that in the event that you have a difficult time reading, uh, there is an audio scanner that you can run over a page that will read something for you. It's possible. It's possible for us to develop a health alert system which will call hospitals or ambulance services in the event of a health emergency. The system tied into a computer bank will supply the emergency medical team with such vital information as sex, age, and the medical history of the ill person to their family doctors as well as any medication the person might regularly take. Such information, needless to say, might be crucial in making life and death decisions. And of course, we have an access possibility. For the first time, we have an opportunity where persons in communities can have a significant say about the kind of programming that's going to go over the system. Seldom, if ever, have persons in communities uh, really had that opportunity. And uh, on the basis of the kind of franchise options that are offered in systems, we know that there are going to be at least three access 
forms or modes. One is an educational access opportunity. They can be used for continuing education for adults, for the training of homebound and the handicapped, for bulletin board announcements of school calendars and board agendas, original television programs of athletic events and plays and programs and science fairs put on by the young persons themselves. We can have teacher in-service training with some of the best minds brought to our teachers. If we can't, if teachers have a difficult time understanding how to reach young persons, particularly in black communities, then let us look across this country and see are there other Marva Collins or are her techniques viable options. Certainly we can train parents through parent training. Under government access, we can have communication between government and taxpayers, between city councils and other governmental meetings. We can have citizen information in-service training and emergency notification systems. And of course, if we have public access, we can have political statements, religious programming, ethnic programming, amateur athletics and entertainers, and conversations with local sports figures. We can also have out of New York City, one of the most popular of all access programs, the Dirty George Hour of Truth, Sex, and whatever else he calls our program. Most cable franchise systems in the major urban communities also include institutional networks which will allow an upstream and downstream flow of information between institutions and that can be a very significant thing. I think that cable is the key to the kind of programming that we need for our major cities in the future. There are other technologies. Let's take one short moment to look at those. Low power television is a reduced scale broadcast television system which is limited in power to fit into the present allocation scheme and table of assignment for higher power VHF and UHF broadcast stations. Its signal will carry about 10 miles as compared to the 60 mile carry of a broadcast signal. Low power television will become a reality in rural areas that lack broadcast coverage before it begins to operate in urban communities where it will be in direct competition with regular broadcast stations. Um, it's expected that special interest groups such as religious, labor, or minority groups will attempt to operate low power stations, usually in a network arrangement linked by satellites. But at the same time as little people attempt to get into it, we know that such large concerns as Sears Roebuck, Federal Express, and the national networks NBC and ABC have expressed interest as well. Now there is, as uh, the attorney will tell you this evening, that the Federal Communications Commission has recently ruled that it will give preferential treatment or preference to minority groups and to minority firms. So hopefully there will be an opportunity for many of you to move into that vital new uh, technology. Another uh, industry, of course, is the multiple point, multi point distribution services. Multi point distribution service is a common carrier, closed circuit, microwave system transmitting a signal addressed to multiple fixed receiving points, usually to apartments and motels. It requires a down converter package of antennas and transmitters and installation to uh, make it operative. It's unlikely, although uh, there is a firm called Urbanet, which, is, which calls itself a wireless cable network service, uh, hoping to reach the top 50 TV markets in America. And it states that its service could be delivered in six months at a quarter of the price of cable. And a lot of people run around thinking that uh, this multi-point distribution system uh, is going to mitigate against, against the possibility of cable proliferation, I can assure you that it probably is not. There are too many technical problems caused by interference with buildings, trees, and bad weather conditions which are still unresolved in terms of that technology. 
Another technology, of course, is direct broadcast satellite service in which one signal is transmitted or retransmitted by space stations in, as I indicated, geostationary orbit above the Earth. And they are intended for direct reception by the general public. There is a limited service uh, to direct broadcast satellites, although they can bring pay television and other uh, pay services. And they can bring you international programming. They could bring you uh, cartoons in French from Canada or live programs from Russia, such as the Bel Bolshoi uh, Ballet or numerous religious programs. The only problem with direct broadcast satellites is that it requires a 10-foot diameter earth station disk that professionally installs somewhere in the neighborhood of $7,000 to $16,000. And that dish must face the particular satellite whose programming is desired. Uh, it's got to be in its footprint. Now there are currently 13 orbiting satellites, but most of the programming is on SATCOM-1. However, SATCOM-1 is the satellite closest to the horizon and therefore is easily blocked by trees or buildings. So, direct broadcast satellites may have some kind of uh, difficulty as far as the future is concerned. Uh, we can talk about subscription television, which is merely a scrambled signal that comes in over a regular television station. They broadcast the regular programming during the day. In the evening, they bring you movies by bringing a little device that unscrambles the signal. So once again, I get back to the idea that cable is the key. Dr. Charles Wright in his sociological perspective of mass communication suggests that there are four essential functions of media and that those functions suggest what we must be about in the future if we are to survive in America's urban communities. The first of those functions is surveillance of the environment for information about imminent threats and dangers and to forewarn the population so that they can mobilize and avert disaster or destruction. We call this news. If we are to survive in cities, we must have a clear view of events and personalities who determine our fates. We must have a sensitive news perspective of people we trust to tell the truth. News operations that are not interested in maintaining the status quo, but news that does not neglect important events and mistreats our political and social leaders. All too often, local media, and even black and other minority media, are so dependent upon advertising revenues that they do not somehow recognize the truth. Because of the subscription fees that are paid to cable, news there will not be wholly dependent or tied to advertising revenues. And recognize this, that was pointed out earlier, more than 200 million Americans depend upon the 6 o'clock news to understand what is going on in our world. The second major function includes interpretation of information. People in our cities have got not only to know the news, and there's so much news out here that few of us, if ever, know what it all means. We have got to have persons who can describe what is going on, what the name of the story is, in order for us uh, to understand. The third major function, of course, is the transmission of culture, focusing on the communication of information, of values, and social norms from one generation to another. We call this educational or socializing, as quietly as it's kept, next to parenting, next to parents, television has more of a significant impact upon the minds and hearts of all people than the church, than schools, than any other institution. The average child, by the time they reach the age of 18, had viewed something like 25,000 hours of television, as opposed to only 12,000 hours in the classroom. And they see everything, and they believe it. And they believe, to a large extent, that this is what the world is all about. 
They see all the stereotypic programming. They see black folks who are essentially helpless and powerless and are always uh, comedic persons, uh, persons who have made no significant contribution to our society and culture, and they inculcate those kinds of ideas. They see the George Jeffersons, and they see the Flip Wilsons, and they see all the other stereotypic uh, comedies out there, and to a large extent they believe black kids to a large extent believe that this is what we are all about. We are not to be taken seriously, that we have not contributed to our society. And of course, those same programs reinforce the negative stereotypes that white folks have of black folks. Time element. Okay, let me wrap up here. The last function, of course, is entertainment. While you are being entertained, you sit down and you have a beer, and you relax, and you let all that good stuff come in, and you turn your mind off, and all that good stuff comes in and socializes you. It comes in time and time and time again, hour after hour after hour. Statistics indicate that within the life space of the average woman living to an age of 87, that 18 years of her life will be spent in front of the boob tube. Okay? You can imagine the kinds of things that she is seeing and the impact that that has upon how she thinks. We have got to produce the shows. We have got to show positive family life of impact families with male heads, families that are supportive of each other, who are tender, who have overcome odds, who have control over their lives, and who are united in furthering their communities. If we can do those things, we'll have a future. If we don't, we're in terrible shape. Thank you. Dr. Maddox, outstanding. This uh, issue that we're discussing here, and before I uh, turn it over to our next speaker, it appears in, in many cases, at least to uh, the bulk of the black folk in the communities uh, are, that we're speaking about here, as a non-issue. For the, for the most part, people, uh, if you'll ask them, see nothing wrong with television uh, because finally it winds up serving a number of purposes for almost no obvious cost. Uh, some of the costs for your own information are the television networks currently are generating four billion dollars approximately uh, and they're generating it in large part on revenues drawn from black communities. That's some of the statistical research that probably remains to be done. By 1990 according to the projections and with the implementation of the new informational technologies approximately 90 billion dollars will be absorbed into these new technologies. So you see that there is a huge increase in as such. Uh, it's something that requires our, our, our participation and our concern. Darlene T. Palmer is a specialist in telecommunications planning and development, broadcast management, and television production, skilled in policy analysis, market planning, and regulatory affairs. Most recently, she was the manager of the Minority Telecommunications Development Program where her responsibilities included coordinating federal and private sector activities to develop and promote business enterprise opportunities for minorities and women. She assisted and advised the Executive Office of the President in the formulation and implementation of the National Telecommunications Policy. Her professional affiliations include the American Women in Radio and Television, the Congressional Black Caucus uh, Communications Brain Trust. After receiving her BA and MA from the State University of New York at Albany, she has worked as a media consultant, a corporate division president, a television producer, and a talk show hostess. Darlene Talbert Palmer. Good evening. I am extremely pleased to be here with you this evening. I was asked to speak on initiatives by the public and private sector 
to increase minority participation in telecommunications and also to address what the federal government and major companies are doing to provide minority opportunities in the emerging technologies of telecommunications. I smiled and thought, things aren't what they seem to be. During the Carter administration, I managed the President's Minority Telecommunications Development Program. The MTDP was established in 1978 with the encouragement of people like Reagan Henry, Pepe Sutton, Gene Jackson, and Ben Hooks to increase minority ownership in the electronic communications. This program was designed to promote initiatives for minority ownership of broadcast and cable television facilities and to help to increase the flow of advertising dollars to minority broadcast owners, publications, advertising and production companies. Because of telecommunications vital role in society, full minority participation was a critical element of the President's program. Through this program, the administration sought to remove barriers that stood in the way of minority participation, particularly those related to financing, property availability, technical training, and employment. The Federal Communications Commission was urged to adopt a minority ownership policy. Changes were instituted in the loan policies of the Small Business Administration and the Economic Development Administration. At the same time, our attorneys were developing federal guidelines to help ensure more government advertising dollars for minority outlets and advertising firms. In essence, MTDP was assigned to coordinate all the federal efforts in this area and also to assist private sectors in establishing minority assistance. At the time, what appeared to be the most significant private sector initiative was the Minority Enterprise Small Business Investment Company, a MESBIC, of the National Association of Broadcasters. The Minority Telecommunications Development Program was instrumental in designing or helping to design this 5013C organization, which is a nonprofit entity and then to get IRS approval. We had hoped that this, would, that this would be another real source of funding for minority enterprises, particularly in the area of telecommunications. The President and his administration was very committed to the success of MTDP. While Mr. Carter was in office, we sponsored at the White House the first Minority Women Communication Technology and Ownership Conference for minority women entrepreneurs. It enabled participants to network with each other. It also helped them to meet the major decision and policy makers of the telecommunications industry, such as AT&T. In the conference, we successfully dealt with the possibilities of minority participation, not only in the conventional outlets of television and radio, but also in the emerging technologies such as cable, telephony, direct broadcast satellite, and so forth. But the Carter administration is gone, and I resigned shortly before my appointment came to a conclusion. While the program hasn't been abolished, it now lays dormant in the executive branch with only a very few trickle-down signs of life in some of the federal agencies and private sector offices giving the appearance of agencies doing much more than they really are. Things aren't what they seem to be. There are no new initiatives whatsoever in the federal government related to minorities today. You have some friends in Washington. You have some committed people in Washington. But those one or two carrying out some of the earlier commitments they're not Republicans, they're not Democrats, they're just committed to minority ownership. In general, most of the decisions are not made 
in the nine to five office meeting, regardless of who you are, but particularly if you're black. In Washington, deals are made at 5.45 a.m. on the tennis court while we're sleeping. And they're made at cocktails at the club, the ones that we don't belong to. Or they're made over the old boy network or over lunch during the old boy network. We're not a part of that and we're not there involved in making those deals. I know because I've watched and I've overheard some of these deals and decisions being made before the commission meeting or the congressional hearing ever took place. Things really aren't what they seem to be at all. I don't want to be totally discouraging. Most of the trade association, the broadcast groups, the foundations, and the government agencies are doing something. They are doing minimum level window dressing for minorities. So if you're interested in publications on careers in cable, how to purchase a television station, or a variety of how-to seminars, they're available. If you're looking for more than this, if you want to be a part of the real deal and decisions, you can't just pick up a telephone or just walk into an office. You're going to have to fight for it. Let me take this a step further. You've got to understand where this country is going when it comes to the telecommunication industry and the new technology in order to decide what is the best financial deal and what are the opportunities that are going to arise. I find that even today, many minorities interested in broadcast investments have no real concept of the financial market in this area. And I'm speaking of, of the new entrepreneurs. Broadcast properties have escalated tremendously in price. It is no longer a deal to get a radio station or a television station. All you end up doing is having marginal profits and a lot of debt. Investing in broadcast properties require long-range plans and the involvement of a group of stations. Most of us simply don't have the money, cannot afford that. Or if we can, the real money-making properties usually aren't available. One station won't make you rich or put you in the game today. Today, diversity is one of the keys to success, both financially and personally, for the minority entrepreneur in telecommunication. If you can own a cable system and also own a production house and an advertising firm, then that's great. The more diverse, the better your chances are of being able to balance the loss against the profits of various entities. But remember, while minorities have recognized the value of telecommunication ownership, so have others. You're competing with the major conglomerates in this game. When low power television was first announced by the FCC, Sears, for example, applied for 153 licenses, while the two minority groups, the first two that had applied, both applied for 10 each. And low power television was supposed to have been designed to give minorities a fair share of the airway. For the new minority entrepreneur, I would strongly suggest five things. One, joint ventures with established business persons. Two, as much diversity in enterprises as financially feasible. Three, programming and software. Four, manufacturing and or marketing of new technology such as cellular radio, computer, and the telephony equipment. Service and or business supplies, especially related to telephony. Telephony is an area that there are absolutely no minorities in an ownership area. I have attended one of their conference as a speaker and out of 3,000 people, I was the only black. And they were overwhelmed. I had more dinner invitations than I have ever had 
because from Charlie Brown right down to every other president wanted to know what was a black interested in telephony. There are opportunities for minorities, but most of them are what we make for ourselves, not what the government or what the private industry is going to give us. Remember, when you become a business person, you become a potential competitor, and the bottom line is green, not black. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Palmer. Like uh, most of the uh, wide-ranging public policies, uh, the Georgetown University's Law Center He's a member of the District of Columbia Bar Association, the Virginia State Bar Association, and the Communications Task Force of the National Conference of Black Lawyers. Mr. Temple is presently Communications Counsel for the United States Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. He was previously employed as Senior Counsel for ICA Global Communications, Inc., Legislative Assistant for Senator Charles Mathias, Jr., and Assistant General Counsel for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Mr. Riley Temple. Thank you. I have for some time been involved in congressional efforts to reform the Communications Act of 1934, both as, a, uh, as an attorney practicing uh, communications law and now a drafter of uh, some legislation. The Communications Act of 34 is a statute that regulates the offering of all communication services, both broadcast and non-broadcast, meaning common carrier. There are three issues relevant to this discussion that are presented by this effort. First, is it really necessary to reform the Communications Act? Second, what changes have been made or are proposed? And finally, what effect will these changes have on entrepreneurial opportunity for blacks? First, the necessity for reform. Forty-eight years ago, when the Communications Act was passed, the telecommunications industry consisted of telephone and telegraph wire. For the average residential consumer in 1934, the telephone, particularly in the cities, was becoming widespread. The telegraph, for businessmen, was significantly aiding rapid communications both domestically and abroad. Today, as you have heard, the telecommunications industry consists of diverse and increasingly complex services and equipment, which I will discuss in greater detail shortly. Technologies range from the traditional telephone system, now aided by sophisticated computer processing techniques, to microwave, fiber optic, using laser technology, coaxial cable, and satellite. Services and equipment available to residential consumers and business users include facsimile, automatic answering terminals, sophisticated push-button telephone and PBX systems, high-speed data communication, electronic message systems, which may put our postal service out of business, and many specialized services combining communication and computer processing techniques. Yet this industry in 1982 continues to be guided and regulated by a statute enacted by Congress in 1934. In fact, Congress has never addressed or set out national policy goals specifically tailored to the telecommunications industry. Instead, it borrowed principles from the regulatory scheme imposed on railroads by the Interstate Commerce Commission. This is not to say that the Communications Act has not served us well. Under the existing system of regulation, founded on the premise of scarcity and monopoly supply, 97% of Americans now have telephone service at fairly reasonable rates. And there is no question that our system is the best in the world. And even in these times of economic downturn, the telecommunications industry remains strong with ever-increasing levels of productivity and innovation. Why then, you ask, is, such a pressing need, is there such a pressing need for telecommunications and regulatory reform? For the very reason that the system worked so well in the past, it cannot work in a competitive environment of today and tomorrow. The system of regulation, designed to produce universality and homogeneity cannot at the same time respond to needs of diversity and specialization. To date,
Congress has failed to respond with a new statement of policy to meet these needs. But its failure to do so is not from a lack of trying. In the past six years, eight major bills have been introduced, a hearing record of more than 10,000 pages has been compiled, and over 1,000 witnesses have testified, and I can count on my hands the number of black faces that have been there. The main issue has been, and continues to be, the structure and role of AT&T in this new environment. The American Telephone and Telegraph Company, otherwise known as Ma Bell, is the world's largest corporation. It dominates all phases of the telecommunications business. No legislation or action involving communications issues can fail to address the, uh, such an issue of overriding national importance. And I hope some of you will ask me later about the AT&T settlement, uh, which is fascinating. At a time when many domestic industries have succumbed to government-supported and financed foreign competition, this nation cannot afford to lose the benefit of Bell's technology and innovation in new and competitive services in one of the few remaining areas of industrial supremacy. The issue, therefore, is how do we create an environment in which the potential benefits of new services are made available to consumers without destroying the benefits of a system that has served us well. The clash of views and interests among potential competitors has brought the judicial system into the regulatory business. Federal Communications Commission decisions restricting or allowing access to new markets have been repeatedly challenged, forcing the courts to rule on these challenges. In general, the courts and the Federal Communications Commission have held to traditional views and have dealt with the problem by attempting to fit new services into old definitions. So the courts and the FCC are establishing national telecommunications policy and not the Congress. This benefits no one. The public pays twice in higher taxes and higher weight rates. And worse, it does not receive the benefit of all the new services we are talking about. New regulatory concepts are bound to emerge from the questions being asked about the old ones. In the telephone industry, for instance, nationwide rate averaging and the subsidies that long distance service provides to local have been called into question and are subject to change. And in broadcast, some argue quite persuasively that the diversity of programming and broadcast outlets may make the venerable public interest standard academic. Indeed, the telecommunications industry monopoly structure, its very backbone, is becoming anachronistic as time and technology move along. Questions presented by new technologies that are of great importance in public interest must not be left to regulatory agencies or the courts. We are in a transition period. Our timetable is governed largely by the speed with which technology is moving these days. If Congress does not provide the answers to these social and economic questions, technology will. Now, what have been the major changes the Congress has made? During the past year, the Senate, under the leadership of Senator Bob Packwood of Oregon, made more progress in deregulating the telecommunications industry than has been accomplished since the 1930s. First, broadcasting. Traditional regulation of the industry by which information is disseminated by airwaves is based on the notion that there is limited spectrum space, scarcity, that the airwaves belong to the public. This notion over the years has been eroded by technology. Spectrum spacing is no, lo no longer causes the interference it once did, and other delivery schemes like cable, satellites, multipoint distribution systems, among others, make the scarcity argument much less compelling. So the Congress set about trying to deregulate the broadcast industry. It began slowly by extending license terms for radio broadcasters from three to seven years and television from three to five years. The Senate is considering further legislation that would bring broadcasters closer to the same type of First Amendment protection now enjoyed by the print media. A Senate bill, S-1629, would remove FCC jurisdiction over program content and information, for example. There will be no requirement for program diversity or ascertainment of community program needs and interests or access of local stations at prime time, or in other words, the game show half hour. While these broadcast measures are clearly the most significant development for that industry, non-broadcast has been the focal point of congressional effort, for there is a whole new world opening up in the area of non-broadcast and common carrier technology. Now, how do we distinguish between broadcast and non-broadcast or common carriers? A broadcast is the dissemination of information to the general public. You need only to pick up the signal via receiver, i.e., your television or radio. A common carriage 
is the, is the dissemination of information to a special audience or person. That is, the disseminated information is intended only for that limited audience. The carrier does not change the substance of the message in any way. The form, however, may be altered. A simple telephone call employs the common carrier technology, and a call to Western Union, who converts the information to written form in the guise of a mailgram, is an example of a carrier which alters the form of the message. What is the flat-footed, duck-billed platypus of the industry is cable television. It employs common carrier technology for delivery and delivers material intended primarily for the distribution to the general public. Unlike other carriers, it does not pick up a message from one person and deliver it to another that the originator of the, of the message intended. The com this common carrier technology promises to revolutionize our lives. Like most Americans, Blacks are not aware of the communications revolution at their doorstep. The technology exists with cellular radio to forego any wire in the use of a telephone from any place. The technology exists to shop, read, and work in your own home. Some argue that portable newspapers and books as we know them will not be made obsolete by this technology. After all, you can't take a viewing screen on the bus or subway on your way to work but who'll need to go out of the home to work. The Senate last year passed a bill, S-898, the Telecommunications Competition and Deregulation Act of 1981. It represents, it represents Congress's most comprehensive effort to date to remove regulatory shackles from an industry ready to burst those governmental restraints. S-898, for the first time, gives the FCC the authority to allow competition as a replacement for regulation wherever possible. In other words, where the marketplace provides reasonable alternatives to a service, regulation must be lifted. The significance of the Senate passed bill cannot be underestimated. It is perhaps the legislation which will most significantly affect our lives in the years to come. By removing regulatory restraints, the barriers to new entry will be substantially reduced. Now, what effect will these regulatory changes have on minority opportunities in the media? Regulated industries have traditionally been looked upon as high-risk investments by lenders. Senate proposals, increased license terms, no regulation of programming policy and so forth, may have, or we hope will make, investment in opportunities in telecommunications much less risky. There's the question of access. Blacks have traditionally argued that a black perspective is sorely lacking in the broadcast arena, and deregulation will only exacerbate that problem. Of course, the access question becomes moot when black ownership of properties increases. FCC policies, which contended to be backed by the Congress, have contributed somewhat, but not nearly enough, to the upward swing, however slight, in black ownership. By the way, what is also clear is that the owners of broadcast properties come from other professions. They're doctors, lawyers, dentists, and businessmen, not from those who work their way up through the ranks. That says something else about the broadcast industry. Now, as for common carrier, it is a highly technical industry whose experts claim years of training and experience. That is the formula that traditionally yields evidence of little or no black presence. What types of technological services are we talking about? Plain old telephone service. Private line services, meaning private phone systems for businesses. Wide area telephone service, or WAPs. Telegraph service, included priving, including private line telegraph service. Cellular radio, that we talked about earlier. Multipoint distribution services, direct broadcast satellite, satellites, a dish on your roof, whose cost I hope will gradually decline as it becomes more, um, more available, and video text and teletext. These technologies exist today, although regulation to a large extent has prohibited their widespread use. But investments in these systems are, not, are far from easy for blacks. They are capital intensive businesses. However, uh, there have been moves to end regulatory restrictions on resale services. This is the process by which an individual or company 
purchases a service, packages it to suit particular industry needs, like the hotel business, and adds value, and sells it to the industry. Just the other day, someone called and said, may I borrow, may I, can I purchase a Watts line from AT&T? The answer is yes. Can I package it, resell it to a group of small businesses? Yes. The cost isn't great, and the yield is, is tremendous. By not having the regulatory burden, lawyers, applications, replies, and a host of governmental barriers, the costs of resale are substantially reduced, and very few people are taking advantage of it, and almost no blacks are taking advantage of it. The major problem for black ownership participation is, of course, capital. But the more involved we become, the less of a, the less of a risk we are perceived to be. We must be sure that we make sure that the government facilitates interest and that it does not, in an effort to do good, erect greater barriers. Thank you, Mr. Temple. Uh, just uh, in a brief pause here, there will be a, uh, a list, a mailing list circulated among the uh, people who are attending this uh, conference uh, seminar. The purpose is to make this ideally the first of a number of meetings of uh, members of the black community around issues uh, of media policy, media ownership, media control. And uh, we're hoping that you'll circulate the list and th the last person will get it back to me. Um, the thought here in, in hearing uh, all of what we've heard from the, uh, the past speakers is that uh, perhaps this new information technology isn't all as cracked up to be, or at least what's new since there doesn't seem to be a place for uh, people of color who aren't already invested with a lot of money to get involved. Um, but despite all the attempts of uh, white America to the opposite, this is a revolutionary time for people of color. And uh, I would offer that our next guest is probably the best uh, indication of just how dramatic the times are. Uh, Percy E. Sutton, aside from being the son of a father who was born in slavery, is an entrepreneur par excellence. He's chairman of the board and treasurer of Inner City Broadcasting Corporation, the parent body for, among others, radio stations WBLS-FM, WLIBAM in New York, and KUTE-FM and KGFJAM in Los Angeles. He's also been board chairman or lead actor in over a dozen ventures, including the Queen's Inner City Cable TV Systems in New York, the first black-owned and operated system to win a cab cable TV franchise in a major metropolitan area. In the political arena, he was a two-term member of the New York State Legislature and for almost 12 years, the chief elected official of the borough of Manhattan in the city of New York. Mr. Sutton left political office in December 1977 and has since played, uh, has also played significant roles in such civil rights organizations as the NAACP and People United to Save Humanity, known as PUSH. A longtime Pan-Africanist, he's also founded and is a board member of TransAfrica, a lobbying group in support of African causes. Mr. Sutton holds the LLB degree from Brooklyn Law School and the honorary doctor of law degrees from Morgan State College, Maryland, and Adelphi University. Probably for the benefit of the audience here, Mr. Sutton was at one time the uh, attorney for Malcolm X, probably one of the greatest privileges. I give you Percy E. Sutton. Thank you, Brother McLeod. Let me just say this. Tony Butler, Lehman Abrams, Lori Jackson, I don't mind getting a letter from you telling me that you can't pay an honorarium, that you can't pay my travel costs to come here, you can't pay the house me while I'm here, but you may be able to feed me. I don't mind that. I do this very often. 
I go without honorariums. I go without food. I go without. But don't ever do this to me again. Don't bring three other brilliant people on the same panel with me and hide my star beneath a bushel. My light must shine. I would not have that happen. Brother McLeod, that you were kind to say that I left office in 1977. <laughs> I didn't leave office. The people left me. I was rejected. I had gone around thinking for a long time. I'd you know, been in the civil rights movement. I'd been in jail. I had been in the reformatory as a kid. I had done all of the things, 125th Street, practiced law on 125th Street, represented Malcolm X, represented the Panthers, I had done all of the things. I, my father, I had come from a large family, youngest of 15 children, all who got to adulthood, went to college. Father was, took us traveling, came here to Boston as a youngster, went to Africa as a youngster, had all of the benefits of a middle-income family on the come. Any of you understand things like on the come? Uh, on the come is something we use in when people who shoot craps, uh, you know, will you make it? It looks like an on the come. Anyway, we c I come from that kind of a background. <laughs> my father told me and my mother reasserted it that if I didn't put my elbows on the table while I ate, didn't pick my nose in public, attempted to be articulate and use the King's English well, that success would be mine. Well, I didn't pick my nose in public. Don't do it now. Don't put my elbows on the table. Attempted to do all of that which was necessary in New York City as borough president. I went to Israel because <laughs> there are a lot of Jews and a lot of Jews in New York City. I went to Rome because there are a lot of Italians in New York City. I went to Ireland with Paul O'Dwyer, and I even went to the trials of Soviet Jewry and was chairman of Soviet Jewry. I did the three eyes, Italy, Ireland, and Israel. And of course, I traveled to Africa very often. I had every indication that I'd be mayor of New York City. They praised me whenever I w returned from one of these countries. They met me at the airport. The cameras focused upon me. They wrote stories about me. And I just knew they would treat me like they treated Tom Bradley. They, but it was not to be. It was not to be. Mr. Koch is mayor of New York City. But it might not have all turned out bad. Because what happened was I left with more than three quarters of a million dollar debt. And I went to Africa to try to liquidate some of that indebtedness. And Africa was kind to me. As a result of this, I was able, and I'm able now to do a number of things that I want to do. A number of the speakers, ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this very swiftly. I'm not going to try to tell you about the technology or anything. I'm going to try to be subjective. It was suggested that I've been able to assemble a number of things. I have. I've been able to assemble it because I was at the right place at the right time. I don't have any special expertise, except that I work long hours, and I'm willing to go anywhere at any time. I work a seven-day week, as much as 21 hours a day. I don't sleep. I don't need a lot of sleep, and I've been lucky. I've been lucky because I've paid, perhaps some of it is because I've paid my dues in the course of things. And I go into cities, I go to places where people remember something that happened 20 years ago when I was good to them. Or I said something kind. I complimented a lady on her dress, a man on the tie that he wore, some simple little thing like that. And out of this comes opportunities. I remember when we bought our first radio station, we had been to 63 lending institutions to get $2,100,000 to buy WLIB, the only 
to be black-owned radio station at that time in New York City, a daytimer. And I didn't understand. I really thought that when they loan you money for broadcast properties, they did expect you to have 60 cents on a dollar like they told me. I didn't know that you could really just put 10 cents on a dollar. That is, all you needed for every dollar was 10 cents, and you could leverage the rest of it. You understand that, don't you? Well, one day I was riding down Fifth Avenue in this long car that get, they gave me a chief executive officer. You know, that was before the problems with the OPEC countries, and we had a lot of gas. And there was a man, and a, one black man, one white man. It was in the rain, and I had the good fortune of recognizing the black man, put them in the back of the limousine with me, which the city supplied for me in my position as borough president of Manhattan, drove them downtown. The man who was white turned out to be the vice president of Chemical Bank. I had been to his bank four times before that, but I'd never caught him in the rain. <laughs> as a result of his having gotten wet on that day, we were able to, within three months thereafter, get a $2,100,000 loan to buy WLIB an AM daytime station with a commitment to get money for a second station, which would be WLIB FM, which later became WBLS FM, the largest radio station in America. Now, and of course, let me explain to you the reason it's largest is because any time you're number one in New York City, you're number one in America because the uh, it's a 13 million audience. And see, Los Angeles is a 7 million metropolitan audience. So it sounds good, <laughs> but it's rough. <laughs> Competition is tough. You see, we got so good that all over the country, there were stations that were mimicking us. And then one station in New York City did it better than we did, called KTU. It came along. We didn't think our audience, we were in, oh, in the boutiques. If you go now even to New York City, in Bloomingdale's, in Lord & Taylor, in most of the houses of prestige, if you will, in New York City, you'll hear our radio station. But it's hard to stay in there because they mimic us, mimic us so well. They hire our employees. They're not afraid of being black anymore. They used to isolate us and say they're black, but now a number of stations are black. ABC in New York couldn't get black enough. And as a result of that, it's turned out to be a talk station now. My point is, if you have a good product, eventually people may buy it. I mentioned that how the money came to me so that no one will say that they'll say Percy Sutton is rich and look how lucky he is somebody gave him something no what happened to me what happened to us was just lucky finding the right man who later became president of the bank in the rain recently we were able to put together in the borough of Queens a 300 million dollar commitment a consortium of banks we got together for a cable TV system because the commitment for the 744,000 homes in the borough of Queens would be in excess of $300 million. And we were able, through an investment banker, to put together the $300 million. Now, how had it started? It had started because many years ago, I had been borough president of Manhattan, and we had cable television. And I had oversight responsibility. And since I was a youngster, I've always wanted to be a communicator. When I was down in San Antonio, Texas, I, can you hear me? Can you hear me without that mic? When I was in San Antonio, Texas, I used to walk around out on the farm there, and I used to go around saying, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Percy Sutton, behind the houses of Philip Young College. And Philip Young College is only 32 stories high in San Antonio. But that was Percy in Texas for me. But I wanted to be a radio announcer. And here my street in San Antonio, Texas, is what we call Grand Central Station. And I grew up. Wanted to be a radio announcer. I never got to be a radio announcer, but in 1964, after so many years of being in the theater movement and having been uh, the person in charge of radio communications and 
having owned the newspaper and they have to then move into the job of the Pittsburgh Courier and having the documents of this be governed by family, family members, friends, anybody who wants high risk money. I'm sorry. Now the 80s will, 80s will be complete, and we will not have helicopters. But what we will have, ladies and gentlemen, is the most fantastic thing the mind can conceive of, and blacks can be a part of it. Earlier it was said that there would be channels, access channels. There is nothing wrong with any of you leasing a channel right here in Boston there is a requirement that cable vision that is here will lease certain channels. There's no reason in each of the cities, though much of it has passed us by, even those cities where we've had political power because we didn't have economic power, we were left out. There's no reason why blacks should not have owned a part of the cable television system in New Orleans, Louisiana. I'm not talking about in rented citizen position. You know what a rented citizen is, don't you? A rented citizen is a person who has status in a city, and one of the giants or person wishing a cable system will come in and have that person join, give a job to that person, entertain that person, or give a job to that person, or give a tiny share of the system, never in excess of 20%, and gain through the prestige of that person through the status of that person or those persons, a cable television system. There's no reason why, with the technology we have today, that New Orleans could not have been divided in two parts. You see, it is where there are multiple franchises, more than one franchise in a city, that minorities have a better opportunity because the kind of money you have to raise requires that it be divided. Baltimore is now talking about giving one franchise. It's a city that is predominantly black, 
but they're talking about giving a single franchise. But they're going to be very kind in Baltimore. In Baltimore, they're going to let a giant entrepreneur have it, but they're going to give that entrepreneur gold stars for the percentage of blacks that they're able, that is, the percentage of equity that they will give to blacks. Now, a simpler way of done it, to have done it, was to divide Baltimore in two or three parts and have interconnections between them. So what I'm suggesting to you is that while you may not own a system, one of the things you can do is utilize some of the channels on those various systems. Utilize some of those channels for programming. One of the things we're trying to do, Brother McLeod, you mentioned earlier, we're using the Apollo Theater. No, uh, we're using the Apollo, th could I just, my throat is dry. <laughs> no falls off, you know what we're <laughs> I think that any of you decided tomorrow to develop a programming, you could get onto most of the systems in this country. We are trying in New York City, by use of a transponder that's on a satellite. A transponder is nothing but a little device that is, device that is on, on a satellite far into the sky that you shoot a signal from a place on Earth to the satellite, to this transponder on that satellite, and then the best way to explain it, it is reflected or deflected down to earth where the signal is picked up and then spread through a cable television system. It's picked up by what is called an antenna or earth station. Is that, is that understandable? You, there's something in the air, you bounce it off and down to the ground in another part of the country. So you do not use microwaves necessarily, nor do you use telephone wires. You just send it through the sky. Now. You could develop programming anywhere in this country, but the problem you're going to have is the problem we had, and that is getting a transponder for two full years. Councilman, I've got to address this to you because you believe in deregulation. Uh, and I want to ask you, what is going to, how are minorities going to gain access under deregulation? Because for two years, we sought to get onto a transponder. It's an old boy network. They say that they're allocated on the basis of priorities given on the basis of first come, first serve. Now, the problem is that black people are never first. We're never first because many people talk about abortion, but one of the things they say, some people say that abortion, that life begins, who have a concern about abortion, say that life begins at conception. Well, transponder allocation are like conception. There's seldom a large audience when it occurs. The old boys get together. Warner will decide in talking with RCA. RCA says, I'm going to put up a, two years from now, I'm going to put up a satellite. Says, give me five transponders. There are only 24 on there. And they've been selling them from $4 million to $15 million. And since we don't know what all of the prices were, one day we went to a sale. We needed a transponder. We couldn't get one. We went to a sale at this prestigious place, and I'm going to close, called Sotheby's, an auction house. Now, what we had done is that which we do every day, and I suggest to you, just as you do it in your studies here, as you've gotten to where you are, we plan well. We knew everything about each of those transponders. There were seven that were going to go on sale. We knew which transponder we wanted. We did not get the one we wanted. But we also understand psychology of a crowd. We are black, and we knew our very presence there was going to create a problem. It was going to attract attention. So we went the day before and selected seats in the auditorium where we were going to be. We provided each of us, and there were seven of us, four white and three black. We are equal opportunity employers, you see. And we had four whites, three blacks. We were going to bid up to $12 million until we got ourselves a transponder. So we went there, and the bid was taken, and the multiples of, they got to $3 million, and then they would go to $3 million, five, four, et cetera. We'd go up to $12 million and drop out. 
we wanted the seventh transponder. But when we got to the sixth transponder, everybody was focusing upon us because every time a bid was made and a sale was made from 14 million four to 12 million, whatever it was, they would give you 10 minutes to call your office to check. Well, each time we went to the phones to call our office to check. And we came back, television cameras focusing upon us, attention all upon us, and we were writing our notebooks. All of us had notebooks. We'd exchange and say something to the press. Very impressive. So finally on the sixth transponder, when they got to ten million dollars, I said ten million one. And someone said ten million two. Ten million three, I said, until we got to ten million seven. And I just stood with the paddle in my hand that you you know you have a number of your number on it. And I looked around and they were so much of the belief that I was going to twelve million. Nobody bid ten million eight. And we won the transponder for ten million seven. Wait a minute. That's the nice part about it. The bad part about it is that last Friday, we filed counsel against your old company, RCA Global, one of your sister companies rather. We filed with the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, a complaint that we want that transponder delivered to us at $10.7 million. Otherwise, we will not be able to deliver our signal, our black music television programming from the Apollo Theater in New York City to the cities of America. Because it is too expensive to go by microwave. It is too expensive to go by telephone. It can only go by transponder. And we don't have access to a transponder unless they deliver that to us. What they've done is, they've said now the transponder, the FCC has said that method of auctioning is not the proper method of allocation. It's discriminatory in pricing. And our counter is, yes, but what you've made is discriminatory in access. And there are people around the country who want, who want black music. And we have the product. We want to deliver it. So, we're not going to put up $13 million, they say. We're going to, with the help of anybody who here wants who's a smart lawyer, we are going to fight the FCC. I must tell you that we've made some other provisions. Now that we've come to public attention, there are a number of people who will lease us some time. We only want seven hours a day between 6 p.m. and 1 a.m. And it looks like we're going to be able to lease that when we want it. But we wanted to buy the whole transponder. And they thought, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we thought we were going to get it. I mentioned this to you just to say that we could raise $300 million to, for a key, cable TV franchise in Queens, but we still couldn't buy a transponder. And I'll tell you the worst part of all. We can't buy, we can't raise $5 million from the private sector to refurbish the Apollo Theater. We are black and we could raise $300 million for white queens because it's a white area. But I could take a white person with me and couldn't raise $5 million for the Apollo Theater. We had to go to the state government to get the money. What I'm saying to you is there are still a number of impediments. It's like the speaker suggested things ain't what they seem. And while we may be entrepreneurs, we may be appear successful, we can raise money, but there's some things we can't do. But those things are diminishing. It is not a bleak world for us. But it will be very bleak for us if we don't get involved right now. The opportunities are there. An array of opportunities, of ownership, of employment, but primarily of ownership in the areas of programming, of marketing, of advertising, of banking from home, of shopping from home, of security, all of these things in the field of cable television. And then there, of course, as has been mentioned before, low power television will use many of those same things. Time is now. The question is what you want to give to it. There's a hell of a lot to be gotten out of it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Uh, we are going to uh, now uh, field a number of questions from uh, the audience here. You will be able to uh, assemble at either side of the uh, seated area where there are microphones, uh, and you'll be able to deliver your question. As well, we want to mention that uh, immediately following this event will be a reception held for the panelists and all of you in the uh, faculty common room, which is, excuse me, in, the, in this area uh, immediately behind the panel area. I also wanted to mention uh, uh, before parting that uh, the next panel discussion of the Cox Lecture Series is going to be held March 18th at 8 p.m. It is entitled Reaganomics its impact on black economic mobility. The participants of this series will include Professor James Hefner, Chairman of uh, e the Economics and Business Administration Department at Morehouse College, Professor Ronald Ferguson, Assistant Professor of Economics and Afro-American Studies, and Christopher Edley, Assistant Professor of Law at Harvard University, who will serve as moderator. We'll hope uh, that all of you will be able to attend uh, that lecture as well. So uh, now we have heard uh, uh, a number of prime players in the what is uh, represented to us as the new uh, uh, information technology uh, boom. It's being called the post in, uh, the uh, post industrial period by some, the second industrial revolution by others. Uh, but as we've heard said, uh, there is uh, much more than meets both the eye and the ear as far as uh, this particular circumstance goes. Um, our participation. Uh, earlier you heard me use the terms uh, informational apartheid and, and the idea of uh, uh, electronic redlining, the fact that uh, despite all of the best uh, qualifications, uh, the right money, all of the things that are supposedly uh, the central questions in doing business in America, we still can't hang. And uh, I'm suggesting uh, here in this area that we're facing questions when our guests leave, and that is what our countenance is going to be, and I'm talking about the black community in this area, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the cable television industry, which has all intentions of coming, uh, taking the money and running, uh, with virtually no participation of the black community. Uh, we're left with the question of the quality of control of the ostensibly black media in this area. Uh, WILD, the radio station, for example, the Bay State Banner, uh, as another example, how much either of those entities, which up to now have been represented to speak for our interests, how much they represent our interest and how much they are controlled by the needs and purposes of the uh, black community in this area. Uh, we can discuss those later. I, I hope that we're going to be able to take uh, as many questions as you're willing to offer. And we can start from this side with Gabby Greeley. Thank you. Although the primary purpose and focus of this panel has been with regard to this country. I have a question about uh, the WARC seminar that's coming up or the WARC conference, which is the World Association of Radio Communication is going to divvy up the bandwidth for um, Region 2, which is North and South America. I'm interested in knowing how, with the United States wanting all of the 500 megahertz of the bandwidth, how is that rationalized, and how should we be concerned about our black brothers and sisters in the Caribbean and throughout the other black countries of this, uh, this world? And I'm addressing my question to Mr. Temple. Um, well, first let me go back and explain um, again what, uh, uh, what happened in, in WARC um, 79. First of all, WARC, as you explained, is a World Administrative Radio Conference that, um, that is a consortium of of, of nations that, and they get together and uh, establish policy uh, for divvying up the spectrum um, and, and establishing arc space <coughs> for uh, satellites. The World Administrative Radio Conference in, in 79, at least the American delegation, felt uh, a little blindsided by, uh, felt they were, uh, by the, um, the presence of and the policies espoused by third world countries. Uh, clearly not, uh, clearly, um, um, uh, were clearly in opposition to the uh, interests of the American delegation, which came and was not prepared. Um, the American delegation is full of, uh, of people who, uh, who are not aware of the problem, um, who uh, have the old 
American idea that um, don't tell us what to do, we'll sit and we'll pass a law. Uh, and the rest of the world is not going to listen. I think black America has to be concerned um, with um, what's going to happen in Ward 83. The interests of black America will be divergent, clearly. Uh, we will have black representation, I hope, uh, on our delegation to the World Administrative Radio Conference. Um, and um, I hope we'll be better prepared. Um, and um, uh, I do believe that, uh, that uh, we'll be faced with a situation in which uh, our black delegation is going to be, uh, is going to feel as if it's being split in two. Um, because there are some primary American interests involved. And clearly, um, if we carry out the American interests, we'll be turning our backs on our black brethren in the uh, Caribbean. Yes, Mackie, thank you. Um, I guess I'd like to uh, uh, ask one question of Mr. Sutton and one question of the entire panel. Um, first to Mr. Sutton, I wonder why you didn't go to Puerto Rico in your travels to Israel, Italy, and uh, other place. However, <laughs> I'll give you a chance to answer that one. <laughs> um, I'm a little bit concerned about the drift of this panel discussion. Having worked in media advocacy and development for the last 12 years, which is a very short time, of the 10,000 radio and television stations we have in the country today, AM, FM, UHF, VHF, STV, and the like, less than 1% are owned by not just blacks, but Latinos and other so-called minorities. I'm very much concerned also that of some 45, excuse me, of over 4,000 or so cable television systems, the so-called new frontier, less, much less than half of 1% of all of those systems are owned by so-called minorities. I wonder if we're not kidding ourselves with cable television, direct broadcast satellite, low power television stations, and subscription television. What I'm concerned about is that, let's just take cable. Given the most optimistic projections of the cable television industry itself, it's not me, because, you know, I, I can't say anything about this thing. But they say that some 50 to 60 percent of this country will hook up to the wide nation. I'm wondering if it's a wise thing for us as people of color to abandon the struggles of access to broadcast, over-the-air broadcast, radio and television at this juncture to chase our tails around trying to gain access to new technology. What's new? Now, Mr. Sutton, you can answer your first question, but I'd also like a, a, a real sincere uh, answer to the second question. Because it, it, it seems to me if we don't set some precedent uh, before, the res before the revolution, I mean, how are we going to get involved in the revolution? Well, as one who's been in the revolution uh, all the while and hope that I'm on the cutting edge of a new revolution, let me first answer with regard to Puerto Rico. Uh, it was a monthly trip. <laughs> Your statistics are good with regard to what we don't have, and much of that which we don't have results from what I always called a black tax. The reason is that when those franchises, those licenses that were granted, blacks did not have constitutional status, if you will, as human beings in America. As a result of this, the only ra radio stations we were able to get license and television license later were those that had already been developed, never the construction permit, as others had gotten. So we paid a high tax for that, and I called it a black tax. I don't think we're abandoning. As a matter of fact, I smile very often uh, when we talk. You were mentioning, Ms. Palmer, uh, my son Pepe and Gene Jackson and Reagan Henry and others involved in the struggle to get blacks into ownership of radio stations. I smile by saying that had there not been a Reagan Henry, had there not been a Gene Jackson, had there not been a Pepe Sutton and others, uh, you would not 
find it so easy as it is today. It's still not as easy as it ought to be, but we jokingly say that we've been so successful at radio business, and we've come to the top in so many cities that they'll give money to you saying it must be easy because the niggers know how to do it now. Uh, you know, there's something peculiar, something easy about radio. Otherwise, they couldn't be successful. So we're not talking about abandoning that. We're saying keep up the fight to get the radio station. But we're cognizant of the fact that the opportunity is fresher here in cable television. We're now, when the licenses are being given out, when the industry in it, in it, is in its infancy, and I think that is the reason we're laying stress tonight upon telecommunications as it is, because here's where a grand opportunity is, and there's not yet a black tax. There's a barrier called money. There's a barrier called politics. But we can get them both together. It can be done. If I may, I'd like to respond to this. <coughs> Broadcasting depends upon advertising revenues. You do not offend broadcasters with controversial programming, as you probably know, uh, because you cannot win. When you get controversial, people turn you off, and that hurts your ratings, okay? Uh, in the cities, though, where there is some degree of political control, if, while you may not control the system itself, within the franchise agreement process, though, there are such things as a slice of the pie in terms of employment, the slice of the pie in terms of uh, lease channels, a slice of the pie in terms of other things. If you can raise the money, for instance, in a city of Detroit, there is no doubt that uh, whatever is ultimately franchised there is going to be minority control. Uh, that minority control will allow access to a great number of resources, programming resources, that can develop the kind of programming that can ultimately be distributed throughout the third world. If I might, I'd, I'd like to exercise my prerogative as a uh, moderator to, to uh, direct a question to uh, Darlene Palmer. Uh, Alva Cox, for whom this series of lectures is written, wrote a very important book uh, published in 1948 called Case, Class, and Race. And uh, as far as those issues are concerned, what kind of efforts are there to involve more women in, uh, broad in these new technologies since uh, clearly you're one of a minority on this panel even? Um, what other kinds of efforts are there to bring more public participation into the, the process of, of uh, communication? I mean, we're at a point where we have black ownership already, and in many cases that black ownership falls far short of what it what it should be. So how are we to bring more of your average working class, community-based folk into uh, you know, the kind of practice that has been reserved for a very small group of people? In terms of the uh, telecommunication industry, I don't feel that there's anyone out there really making an effort to ensure minority or women participation. Um, as I mentioned, it was a year ago that we had the first Minority Women's Telecommunication Ownership Conference. I had expected to have a second. Carter did not win, Reagan didn't like the program, and there's not going to be a second. I think that most efforts are going to be what we do ourselves. I think one of the most important things for women and minorities are to be aware of the new technology. And some of it really isn't new technology. It's just, it's the old established technology, but there are new ways of using it. People that are in this industry have what I call and what is called the Bible of the industry, which really gives you overviews of what's going on. And I brought them with me. Um, TV Digest, Telecommunications Report, and Broadcasting. Their publications, along with the Wall Street Journal, that you need to read weekly. Well, they come out every week, the journal every day. 
to let you know what is going on in this industry, what's coming up, who the players are. This is what they read. This is how they keep up. And it'll put you one step up by knowing what's out there, not taking what is published and given to you by the NAB, the FCC, NCTA, because then you get what a trade association or what a particular group wants you to know about the industry, not what's really there. I think it's extremely important for you to keep up on the industry, and the only way you can keep up on it is by being aware. I think that women and minorities are going to have to make their own opportunities, but there are a hell of a lot of opportunities out there. And, and now we're at ground level. That's why it's important to look at the new technology, because we're not talking about coming into business where the the cost has escalated to the point that you can't afford it or that you're mortgaging your life to try to get your foot in the door. But we're talking about ground level. I have uh, materials here for anyone that wants them also. I, um, I'd like to thank the panel for listening to me tonight. I enjoyed your talk very much. Um, I have a particular interest in the uh, subject tonight. My name is Wes Williams. I operate a small minority company called Advanced Media, all two of us. Um, we're going to go online this June. We're going to reach 200 households in an existing um, apartment unit system. We make a program, and we've been making program for the past couple of years. Um, we're going to produce two spots that are going to be shown on broadcast television, two public service announcements. Uh, we're worried about getting access to a cable channel. Um, we started the business in 1975 with a couple hundred dollars. The business will be in six figures next year. Um, most of the work is uh, commercial photography and video. I guess this question is addressed to you, Percy, particularly interested in what you uh, did in New York. What is the proper procedure for us to follow to assure that we can lease or get access to one of those channels that are going to be here in Boston five years from now? You can call the mayor's office. I always go to the top. Find who his person is with regard to cable television and simply ask the question, it would seem to me, as to what the provisions are as to lease channels. They're probably on a first-come, first-served basis. That is, I would guess, I would guess that the city of Boston has required Mr. Charles Dolan, Chuck Dolan, who got the franchise, to lease certain, a certain number of channels. If I were you, I would be interested in leasing one of those channels and producing my programming with advertising, however you care to support it. It should be not too difficult. I'm sure that in all of Boston there will be at least one minority, least channel. I hope so. Okay, because we're we're at this time. Okay, we are we are particularly um, interested in this. This is something that we were doing before the franchise franchise um, came out. My uh, history, work history, goes back on broadcast television from '67 up until um, a few years ago. Um, most of the program that we were doing was programming that was done, obviously. Um, to reach a target audience because it wasn't available in the